Yesterday I talked a bit about uh, modeling languages with various kinds of effects, including uh, state effects. And both for the wild language and for the higher order language that I talked about, I talked about the state monad. And the state monad was a, a very simple thing. Uh, with T of X was just S arrow, S cross X. And this model's global store. So the idea is there's some collection of L values, of, uh, of locations that you can uh, read and write. Uh, and that's fixed for all time. And any part of the program can see uh, uh, any of those references. So the state monad that I talked about yesterday is quite good for, for modeling that kind of program. But that's completely unrealistic. Any interesting programming language doesn't have a fixed collection of global storage locations. Um, it has dynamically allocated references. So uh, as the program runs, it generates new references uh, which can be read and written. And it turns out that when you combine this facility to generate new references with higher order functions, then the theory of the programming language gets dramatically more um, interesting. So uh, the kind of thing I'm talking about, um, if I switch to, uh, to ML syntax, um, something really simple like... Uh, like this is a valid contextual equivalence in a language like ML. So this says, let R be ref zero, so generate a new reference cell, stick zero in it, um, and then forget all about it and just return three. And this is contextually equivalent to the program that just returns three. But if you take a very simple-minded approach to modeling these programs, then you'll discover that these things um, uh, aren't equated in a simple model because this thing has some, has some effect on the store. If the store is just one big global thing which is always available, then there will be things in your model which take a look at the store, even though you can't write a program that takes a look at the location you just allocated, and they will be able to distinguish this program uh, from this one. So more exciting examples happen when you start to combine higher order functions, as I said. So... Uh, I take a function, a computation that generates a new reference and um, and returns a function. So now I've generated a new reference and I've um, returned a function which takes a dummy argument and when it's called it checks this reference to see whether it has zero in it and if it does then it uh, returns one otherwise it returns two. So here this reference is not being thrown away for the future of the program. It's going to persist. Um, and in fact, what's in it matters to, to the behavior of the program. But from the outside, you can't tell the difference um, between this program and the one that just uh, uh, returns the constant one function. So this reference is generated. It has to be there in the store for this function to behave itself. But the reference is never leaked to the outside world. Nobody else can see its existence. Nobody else can mutate it. This function doesn't mutate it. And so the value will indeed always be zero. <coughs> and uh, I guess we have a next level up of interesting examples where we have things which involve state on both sides. So here's, so both of those were pure from the outside. They didn't have any visible effect. Um, but here's a, um, and we'll uh, say uh, uh, R colon equals bang R uh, plus one. So here are two functions which are stateful from the outside. You can tell that these things um, have some effect on the store. So this one generates a reference and uh, it returns a, uh, a little counter function. So um, when you call this function for the first time, you'll get back one. When you call it for the second time, you'll get back two and so forth. And here's another function, also generates a reference zero. And this time, every time you call it, it decrements the contents of this reference cell. But then it returns the negation of what was in the reference cell. So these two guys are contextually equivalent from the outside, but as they evolve, you can see that what's held in the store uh, is quite different between in the executions of, of the two programs. But there's going to be there's some connection, there's some, some relation between the possible um, evaluations of these things, which uh, the differences 
between which are not discernible by, uh, by external contexts. And if we make a simple-minded model of our language, then, then things like this uh, won't hold. And of course, things like this are, are kind of important um, for, for proving interesting programs correct, because usually we're trying to use store to implement something, uh, something functional from the outside, certainly in the case of, uh, of ML. So, I mean, this is, uh, uh, this is something that goes back a very long time, right to the beginning of the study of denotational semantics. So there are papers back from the, from certainly from the very early 80s, trying to look at uh, semantics of ALGOL, which is uh, uh, a little bit simpler than ML because it only has these block-structured bits of state. But it's still the case you can have encapsulated storage of this kind, and, uh, and proving equivalences there is, uh, is tricky. <coughs> so, just to be concrete, and to get back to our monads for a minute, um, this is, a, this is a toy language with, uh, with dynamic allocation, and uh, it's structured in a, a kind of interesting way. Um, so uh, this should look uh, fairly familiar given what I talked about yesterday with the uh, monadic meta language. So this is actually a fragment of, of something like the internal language in a, in a, a couple of compilers that we've built. <laughs> um, so this is, a, this is a sort of version of the computational meta language which we use as the internal language in our compiler. And you can translate an ML-like language into this by the, by the core by value translation. But this has a, a nicer equational theory, as I, as I was saying yesterday. So we separate value types from, uh, from computation types. So these are, these are the value types. So we've got unit, which is uh, the one-point type, integers. And we've got reference, reference types. And to make things simple, I'll make the things that you can have references to be of a special class of type, sigma. And these are either integers or references to things which are storable. So in this language, we can store integers in the heap. And we can store references to integers. And we can store references to references to integers and so forth. Uh, but we can't actually store functions in the heap because giving a semantics to a language with functions in the heap involves you in recursive domain equations and, uh, and other such complexities. So, um, so we've got, uh, we've got references to, to things of storable type. We've got product, coproduct, and we've got function types. And since this is intended as the, the target of the translation of a core by value language, um, we're going to restrict the function types to be of the form tau arrow t of tau, tau because that's the only kind of function space that we'll ever need to interpret things coming from our source language. So, so um, you can kind of immediately see that these guys are really kind of morally living in the Kleiser category. Um, and I'll use gamma to range over uh, the, the union of both uh, computation types and uh, value types. So the terms are fairly conventional. We've got uh, variables, integer constants. Now this class here, L, is picked from some collection of locations. Um, now source programs in an ML-like language never mention any literal locations. You never actually refer to location 374 in your ML program. But when you do the operational semantics of the programming language, then as the program runs, it generates new references. And it's convenient to set things up um, that you allow the terms that are appear in the operational semantics during execution to contain the location constants that correspond to things that have been allocated. So we'll include those in the grammar, even though they don't occur in, in source programs. We've got the unit thing. We've got pairs injections and recursive function definitions. And I've put the syntax into a, a kind of normal form. So we've made this syntactic separation between values and computations. And then we're going to restrict the syntax of the language so that you can only form the pair of two values. So this is a very, very sort of common trick. It's a bit like, um, a, bit like a normal form uh, that's uh, commonly used in compilers. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to force you to use this let construct, which we know from from yesterday's lectures, to sequence all the evaluation very explicitly and to name all the intermediate results of computations because that makes, uh, that makes rewriting on, in the compiler uh, a lot more straightforward. So, so pairs are restricted to be of values, and similarly, injections into the coproduct have to be applied to values. Um, here's the syntax for recursive function definitions. And note, here's a way of putting the type of the argument and the result on the recursive function definition that's uh, slightly neater than the one I had yesterday. Um, and then application, now this is going to be a computation, of course, because a function is going to be something of type t to, sorry, tau to t, tau primed, um, applied to something of type um, tau, um, and the, the result of that is going to be a computation type. But we restrict, again, the application here only, only applies when the, both the function and the argument are already valued. So here's the let construct, um, which corresponds to the let from the computational meta language. Here's the val construct, again, this is the thing that's going to inject values into computations. Um, projections, arguable, you can make those uh, values or computations, but I've just made those computations here. Um, 
ref v, this is the computation which allocates a new reference whose initial contents are v. Again, this has to be evaluated. Bang v, this is the computation which dereferences um, some value v. Um, and assignment, which assigns this value v primed to uh, the and puts the v primed into the location pointed to by v. Case expressions, again, the scrutiny of the case expression has to be a value, but the two arms are obviously computations. We've got equality testing on both integers and uh, references. Um, some bunch of arithmetic and conditional tests as well. <coughs> so, um, when we, when we, as I say, when we're setting up the type system for the source language, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't mention any location constants, so um, uh, we wouldn't need anything in the typing derivations for those. But if we do want to have a type system which applies to the intermediate configurations during evaluation, then we'll have to have something that records the type that we uh, that uh, we associate with these location constants. So we're going to have two kinds of thing in the uh, in the typing judgments. One of which is the context which binds variables to types, these are honest to goodness variables, and then a store type which maps locations to storable types, uh, sigma. Okay, so here are the typing rules. And uh, again, this should look fairly like a, a kind of restricted version of the type rules for the meta language. So here's the, uh, here's the rule for, uh, for typing location constants. So, so delta is the store typing, and gamma is the environment, and uh, so when, when we see a location constant, we look it up in the, uh, uh, in the store typing. And when we see a variable, obviously, we look it up in the, um, uh, in the context. This is just an extract of the, uh, the typing rules. Um, so recursive functions, just as it was before, except that we've put the t's in explicitly. So uh, rec fx equals m has type uh, tau to t of tau primed, just when m has type t of tau primed in a context where x has type tau and uh, uh, f has type tau or t type primed. So again, just as before, this because this is a call by value language, you'll only ever see value types occurring in the context because those are the only things that we'll ever substitute. We'll only ever substitute values into expressions. So the guy, there are actually two typing derivations here, really, two forms of typing judgment. One where there's a value on the right, like this, and one where there's a computation on, or, or this, and one where there's a computation on the right, like here, um, but the guys on the left are always values. So uh, here's the typing rule for let, which is the, the familiar looking rule from yesterday. So if m is a computation of type t1, tau1, and uh, m2 is a computation of type tau2 under the assumption that x is a variable of type, a value of type tau1, then let x be m1 in m2 uh, is a computation of type tau2. And here's the rule for val, which takes you from a judgment about a value having type tau to that value treated as a trivial computation which has type t of tau. <coughs> um, here's the equality test on references. So um, if you have uh, v1 is a, is a sigma f and v2 is a sigma f, then v1 equals v2 is a computation of, well, unit plus unit just being a, a kind of um, representation of the Booleans. And uh, then the, the more interesting things with references are these three here. So uh, dereference, if v is a value of type sigma f, then bang v is a computation, it's something that, uh, that has side effects um, of type uh, t sigma. <coughs> This is the rule for creating a new reference. If v is a value of type sigma, then ref of v is a computation which will return something of type sigma ref. So it's a dynamic allocation there. And assignment is just like it was before. So if v1 is a value of type sigma ref, v2 is a value of type sigma, then v1 colon equals v2, the assignment statement, is a computation, has side effects, but it doesn't return an interesting value, so it's of type t unit. OK, so, um, so when, we, uh, when we give an operational semantics to a language like this, we've got a whole bunch of... Hi. Can you explain the difference between delta and gamma? Oh, sure, sorry. Uh, so, uh, so, here, so, so gamma... Um, uh, sorry, gamma is the normal typing context. So that's the thing that says for each variable in the program, the x's and the y's. OK? And those are the only things that occur in source programs. So when you write your ML program, it's got R's and X's and so forth, and those are the only things that, and those are assigned types by gamma. But when you do the operational semantics of this language, when we, uh, when we come to, to give a rule for, uh, for ref, um, there'll be a transition which generates a new location. Okay, and we have to represent that location somehow in the term. If we're going to write an operational semantics in terms of terms making transitions to new terms, then the term that you go to will have, will have something in it, and that something is not a variable, it's a location. 
Okay, so the real, you know, so 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 these guys, yeah, X's and Y's. The other things you can think of as memory location 478, which was returned by the storage allocator. And now we're going to have a term that sort of has memory location 478 in it. Um, once we've done that, and uh, those things are reflected in the um, in the delta. So if you just wanted to type source programs, you wouldn't need the delta at all, and you wouldn't include the L's in the um, uh, in the uh, syntax of terms at all. And in some ways, that's nicer. Uh, but if you want to give an operational semantics that works by rewriting terms rather than doing something more machine level, then, uh, uh, th then this is the, the nice way to do it. And uh, uh, again, we still have a choice as to whether we want to worry about whether intermediate configurations can be typed according to some type system. Uh, but it's very standard to talk about the syntactic type soundness result. And if you want to prove a syntactic type soundness result, then you have to extend your typing system to type not just the programs you started with, but to say whether all the intermediate configurations that, ev uh, that uh, happen as the uh, computation progresses are well typed. Because the theorem kind of says uh, that well typedness is preserved. And these new guys, these L's, occur as reduction happens. And so you have to have type rules that cope with those. Um, okay. I mean, I, th I mean uh, it, it, it would be cleaner and more pleasant to do away with these things altogether, I think. But, uh, but it is very standard to prove these syntactic type soundless results. And so, uh, so we do that, so we have to, have to include that in the syntax. Question? In the uh, Alice rule at the lower left, mm -hmm. um, should deltas be increased to refer to the new value? No, 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 this is a right? static type system. Okay, so this is so 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 the allocation hasn't happened yet, right? So so ref v is there in your program, and it has type computation of sigma ref at, at this point, right? But in the dynamic semantics, if we were then to, as I say, prove this syntactic type soundness result, then then indeed yes, a delta which was extended would would occur at, at that point. But that doesn't happen until we do the operational semantics. Okay, but yeah. Um, so we can write, we can give an operational semantics to this in various different styles. So there's a sort of standard small step presentations and big step presentations. And those are going to include the term that's being evaluated and the heap in which it's being evaluated. And that thing would take a transition to a new term and uh, an updated heap. Um, so uh, that would be the standard way of doing things. And now I'm just going to confuse you by giving a, giving pre giving a slightly... Uh, uh, a different presentation, and this is this is a presentation that makes proving theorems about the operational semantics uh, much easier. And it's uh, it's a particularly nice demonstration of the benefits of working with this uh, computational meta language based syntax, which has a has a kind of nice uh, nice proof theory. So if you're familiar with with other people's work, there's a presentation by Andy Pitts of uh, operational semantics in terms of frame stacks, in which he explicitly works with configurations which have a term and in this case a heap, uh, and then um, a continuation which is represented as the concatenation of a whole bunch of uh, frames, each of which kind of correspond in a real implementation to the stack frames in the, uh, in the calling chain. Um, and Matthias Verleissen and his co-authors work with evaluation contexts. So there they represent the operational semantics in terms of a, a factoring of the term to be evaluated into a surrounding context which is the, the part that's going to remain unchanged under evaluation, and the actual redex, which is placed within that context. Um, so there's, a, there's two notions. There's the context in which you're doing the evaluation, and then there's the actual evaluation which takes place. And because we've got this uh, nicely behaved syntax in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of the uh, explicit let construction, it turns out we can do something very similar, something that explicitly represents um, both the, the term to be evaluated and the continuation, the context in which it's being evaluated, entirely within the syntax of the language that we have already. So, um, so our configurations will be terms of a particular shape, which will make explicit the distinction between the place where the action's happening, the place where the re reduction's taking place, and the continuation, which is what you're going to do next. So, um, so this is the way we're going to present the semantics. So sigma is going to be the heap, the, um, the dynamic... Um, runtime data structure in which we have all, the, um, all the, uh, um, the state. And then the term that we're evaluating is always going to be a let expression. So it's always going to be something of the form let x be m in k. And the idea is when we evaluate something like this, m is, m is going to be the first thing that we evaluate. And then k is going to be, as the name suggests, the continuation, what's going to happen next. And we say, and rather than bothering to talk about all the intermediate states which happen during evaluation explicitly, we're just going to axiomatize directly this relation. When is it the case that let x be m in k converges? So our language has got recursion in, so um, uh, divergence is a possibility. And we're going to choose as our notion of observation, so I was talking yesterday about how 
our notion of contextual equivalence in the equations that we want to prove is affected by uh, exactly what notion of observation we choose. And here, we're going to choose our notion of observation on, on uh, programs as just being, do they converge or do they diverge? Because it turns out that that induces the same notion of equivalence as lots more uh, explicit things like do they converge or di uh, to a particular numeric value or so forth. You can always uh, just, uh, just change the continuation to, uh, um, to check whether the answer was seven and diverge if it did and if it was and, uh, and converge otherwise, um, in which case you, uh, you end up with the same notion of contextual equivalence. So, uh, so the operational semantics is going to be formalized this way. So, so when is it the case that let x be m in k converges when the state is a sigma? And sigma is going to map locations, these location literals, these Ls, to the sorts of values that you can store in the heap. And the sorts of values that you can store in the heap are, well, they're either integers, integer constants. So when I've got here, I've got ref zero. So this thing will dynamically allocate some location L, and it will bind L to zero in the heap. Or, because we had references to references, you can have other locations stored in, um, in a cell in the heap. So, the, so uh, a, a state is going to be a map from locations to the disjoint union of integers and other locations. Okay? So, M is one of our computation terms from the language, and the K, under which we're evaluating this, is going to be another term in the language, but we have a, a type system for those which kind of makes explicit the way that we're, we're reading them. When we write that with this this little perp sign up at the top, which means uh, acceptor, okay? So the idea is M is going to run and it's going to produce a value which gets bound to X, and K is going to be some continuation that wants to consume a value of type X. So K, so K might be something as simple as val X, okay? So that's a continuation that just returns the value it gets, okay? So this is an acceptor of X's of type tau for any tau. And, but the continuation will more generally be something which corresponds to the call stack uh, when you're evaluating. It will be a, a whole uh, a complicated expression, which itself is a, a, a computation that's, um, uh, that's expressed in the terms of the language. So here's how you build up a more complicated continuation. So um, if K is already something which accepts a Y of type tau primed, and M is a term which, ex which under the assumption, single variable here, under the assumption that X is a value of type tau, has type T of tau primed, which is what K expects, then let Y be M in K is something which will accept an X of type tau. Okay, does that make sense? Good. <coughs> right, so. Right, so here's the, uh, here's the presentation of that, um, uh, of that relation. So the, the, the base case here, this is when we get termination, is when we have let X be val V in val X, and here that will terminate. Okay, so V is a value, and you can see, yeah, intuitively, you know, what this does is it just says, oh, right, I've got a value. I substitute it for x in here, and I'm done. I've got nothing further to do. That's, you've, you've reached the top of the call stack, right? You've, you've, you've come out to the top of the, um, uh, the, the end of the program. <coughs> so um, here's, the, here's, the, here's the case where we actually kind of, morally speaking, return to something further up the call stack. Um, so if you've got let x be val v in, and we haven't just got val x, we've got the other form that we can have for the continuation. So there's a... There's a uh, there's a, a frame above us in the call stack, um, and that itself looks like let y be m in some other k, okay, so this is the co encoding of the stack, um, then this thing will terminate just if this thing terminates, and this thing is what you get by substituting v for x in m, and then kind of carrying on and doing k, okay? So if you read these rules sort of from the bottom to the top, it, it's encoding a little transition system for an abstract machine, if you like, where the configuration is always a term to be evaluated and a continuation. But we get to play this nifty trick that we express those, those two parts, the term to be evaluated and the continuation, all in the same language. Yeah. Um, so it sort of looks like a normal let binding where you're saying let x equals equal v, but you're actually saying let x Yes, so normally you, you're going to have a complicated thing uh, in this position, and that's the place where the next bit of evaluation has to happen. Yeah. Okay, um, in the case where the, the complicated computation is actually just val v, it's not complicated at all. That's that's I mean, remember val is return in Haskell syntax, right? And that's exactly what this what this means, right? So so this is this thing has re has has got all the way down to a value. There's nothing further to be done here. So we, so now we're going to return that v to the next guy up in the call stack. Okay, in place of x. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Uh, well, um, yeah. That's right. Um, so um, so x could be. 
Uh, it had better be free in the, well, it was probably free in the term M. Yes, if M's going to do something, but it won't be in K. Uh, <coughs> so it's just returning it up one step. Yeah. 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 Okay. Now, so the clever part, and the, the reason that we can play this game with, uh, with using just one, one syntactic form is that we have this nice, um, uh, nice equational behavior of our, um, of our uh, computational-based language, and that's, that's made explicit here. So this is the case where, this is the case where something uh, interesting and non-trivial happens. So, so here we've got the configuration is let x be something in k, and the something is not just an immediate return. It's something more complicated. It's a let expression itself. Okay, so the, the computation that we, we're to perform is let x2 be m1 in m2. Okay, so that's the other form of computation that we could, uh, uh, that we could generally have. Um, and so because we have this let of the let rule in the computational meta language, which lets us reassociate let bindings, what we do is we say, well, the, this thing is a complicated expression. I've first got to do m1, bind the result to x, x2, and then do m2, and then I'm going to do k. Well, so I can reassociate these things like this. So I say the next thing to do is let x2 be m1 in, and now my new computation is let x1 be m2 in k. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is saying that to, you know, evaluating, the, evaluating this, this complicated let expression breaks down as first do this bit, and then the continuation for the whole thing is, is, is this, um, uh, this expression up at the top. So it's the fact that we have this sort of nice equational uh, uh, rule that lets us, uh, lets us present things in this style. So for the uh, uh, so this is the this is the, the generic form of computation. We've got other forms of computation which happen when we when we do uh, um, recursive function calls or assignment or uh, generating new references and so forth. And those are down at the bottom. And those are those are kind of all uh, um, uh, of, of the same shape. So uh, so here's an equality test, for example. So here it says let x be, and then the test is does L equal L primed um, at in K, and that thing will terminate just if let x be val false in k terminates, okay? Because l equals l prime is false if l and l prime are different. Um, obviously, you get a true in there if, uh, if they were the same. Um, so here's the, here's the uh, evaluation in context rule for doing an assignment. And notice that we've got literals here. We've got l and l primed in here because the syntax of the language ensures that these things are, these things are never going to be uh, complicated expressions. We've always got literal values. And the only literal values uh, of type location are actual location constants, by, so, so they will have they will have been uh, um, evaluated down to down to ground form by the time you hit this rule. So here's doing an assignment. So let x be l gets l primed in k. So this is assigning a pointer uh, in, uh, to so, so l is something of type sigma ref ref. Um, so this thing will terminate just when let x be val unit in k terminates in the store updated here. So now this is sigma with l gets in left of L primed. Okay, so again, if you read it from the bottom to the top, it looks like a transition system. Um, so we take a step from here to here. This is the, the new configuration. <coughs> okay, so we've updated the state. And the in left is because our, the, the R values in our store were either integers or location constants. So here's the, uh, here's the rule for dereferencing. So now this says if sigma of L is in left of some L primed, um, and sigma um, of let x be val L primed in K terminates, then sigma and let x be bang L in K terminates. So this is looking up the contents of location L primed, and uh, what we get back here is val of, um, of L primed, which is um, what was stored in the, in the heap. And then here's the tricky one. This is the, um, the rule for uh, dynamic allocation. And then now we've got let x be ref. Um, uh, this is generating a new reference. I should probably have used an integer here because this is... Uh, gratuitously contains two references. But um, so here, um, L primed is the, uh, is the thing we're going to store into a new reference cell. Okay, so we've got let x be ref L primed in K. And that terminates just when let x be val L in K terminates in a heap where uh, um, sigma is updated such that L points to in left of L primed. This is the thing we were storing in, a, in our freshly allocated reference. For L some location which is not in the locations that are mentioned either already in the store in sigma, so it's not something that's already been stored there. It's not mentioned in K, so it's not something that's been previously generated uh, in K, and uh, it's not the L primed that, uh, that we're actually um, uh, storing in the, uh, in the heap. So this says that the L we pick has to be fresh for all the other bits of the context, okay? 
Um, so if you, again, if you read it from the bottom to the top, this says uh, this configuration takes a step to this configuration where we non-deterministically pick some L which is not mentioned anywhere else in the configuration. And this is one of the things that causes us some problems when we come to model um, this language because, um, yeah, we've got, we've got non-determinism uh, rearing its ugly head here um, because you can pick any location which is fresh um, for, um, uh, for, for everything else in sight. So it's going to be something that wasn't, uh, um, wasn't allocated before. But the trouble is, this isn't really a non-deterministic language. Okay? So uh, ML programs are quite determinant. We pick a fresh location, but it had, be it had better not matter which fresh location we pick. The only thing that matters about it is that uh, it's different from all the guys that other people have, um, uh, have already seen. And so we want to be sure that, um, that the rest of the program will behave equivalently if we pick any, any of the L's that we could have picked here. It won't make any difference. And uh, if we were naively to try and, try and make a denotational model of a, of a language like this, we'd say, oh, there's a, there's a non-deterministic transition, so we have to do something like the models of non-determinism that we had, and we'd introduce a power set, or in this case, some kind of power domain, and then our life would be a misery for no good reason, because this non-determinism is not real non-determinism. Um, but we're going to have to work, do a bit of work to show that it doesn't matter, that the choice of location doesn't, um, uh, doesn't affect the final outcome of the program. Um, <coughs> So, so that's one thing. So we're going to have to deal with this non-determinism if we want to make a, a nice, nice model of this language. And then the other thing is we're going to have to deal with this encapsulation phenomenon that I put over here. So, so again, if we, if, we, if we did the obvious thing, if I, if I turned this into a program in Haskell, right? So this is, a, this is a, a, a little reduction system, and I could say the state is, well, it's a map from locations to, uh, uh, to values, which are either integers or other locations, and I'll write a little um, allocator, which perhaps is deterministic. Um, it, uh, it just bumps up a counter uh, to, uh, to say what's the next free location, and that's what it always returns. If I wrote that, wrote that little Haskell program, it would run okay. It would, um, it would certainly give me the right answers for all my programs. But if I then tried to reason about it, and I tried to you know, say, oh, we know how to reason about functional programs, so there's no problem, and I tried to prove in that... Uh, in the Haskell, uh, uh, in the semantics of Haskell, that these two, the interpretations of these two programs were equal, uh, I wouldn't manage to do it, right? Because the um, uh, the model in Haskell contains still functions which break the abstraction barrier of the heap and go in there and have a look, and they say I, there's a function in there that returns uh, uh, true if location 37 has been allocated so far and false otherwise. Um, and as soon as you've got those sorts of things in the model, then these nice equations that we want to prove um, don't hold. So we've got to deal with the non-determinism. We've got to deal with this phenomenon that bits of heap are encapsulated. So, um, say, people have been trying to address this for, uh, uh, for many years. And uh, one of the first solutions which people came up with uh, called, is called functor categories. So the idea is that as um, we've got the collection of, we're going to have a, some, some kind of interpretation of the set of locations. We don't want the interpretation of the set of locations to just be all possible locations because uh, then we've got functions that do all kinds of, uh, of bad things to the heap in our model and that will break, uh, break equations. Instead, what we want to say is that the meaning of the type of locations is something which varies as the computation progresses. So when the computation starts out, um, there are no locations at all to be had. And then as, as more locations are, uh, are allocated, um, the meaning of the type sigma lock can expand. Um, and what we want to do is we want to, um, we want to account for that by, uh, by instead of working with the meaning of the type being something that's fixed, say the meaning of the type is something which can evolve. It's going to be parameterized by what the current state of the, um, of the uh, computation is. So, um, so it turns out you can do this. And um, <coughs> the basic idea is before we had, uh, we had some category and we would interpret our types as objects in that category. And the category was going to be something like sets or CPOs. Um, and now we're going to model our, uh, our types as objects that can vary, objects that are parameterized by something. Okay? And um, <coughs> so, um, so sets is the category of sets and functions. Instead of modeling a type in here, we'll model a type in this kind of slightly scary looking gadget, sets to the i. And i would be something like the category of uh, finite sets and injections. <coughs> so the idea, the, the idea behind this is that 
finite sets and injections. So these are really, there's a really simple thing. So an object kind of looks like that, and here's another object, and then here's a map between them. Okay. And the idea is the objects up here in I are going to represent the current state of the world, which, like, which references have been allocated. And an injection is a way of saying, as you move forward in time, because obviously if you, if, you, uh, if you follow an injection, you can only go into something which is at least as large as where you were before. So, so if you go forward in time, you will have allocated some new storage, and you use the fact that you have arbitrary injections to account for the fact that you could you could consistently rename all the references. So that's going to deal with this business. That so, so the fact that there are more references allocated um, as the computation progresses is going to be uh, captured in the fact that these sets can get bigger. Uh, but then we're going to also allow, as you move forward, that you can consistently swizzle everything around. And that's going to capture the fact that um, nothing in the semantics of the language should be sensitive to exactly which locations you picked when you did the dynamic allocation. So, so this is going to model the kind of the state of the world and changes between the state of the world. And then the meaning of types are going to be objects in this category. And an object in this category is a functor from here to here. So it's something that says, for every uh, uh, one of these finite sets, what do I look like? Right? So there's going, to be a, there's going to be a sort of um, meaning of uh, sigma ref at, I don't know what to use for these guys, um, uh, little s perhaps. Okay, so there'll be a mean. So, so, so now the meaning of a type will be parameterized by um, by where we are in the possible world. And furthermore, when you go forward, because this is a functor, um, if if you go from s to some s primed by some injection here, um, then there'll be a way of going from here, the meaning of sigma ref when you were in world s, into the meaning of sigma ref when you were in world. Uh, S primed, and that has to behave itself nicely. So uh, these will be uh, uh, there'll be uh, uh, maps between these guys will be uh, will be natural transformations. So they will respect this way of moving moving forward in time. So this actually this actually works quite well, but it's notationally it's a bit hairy to work with, um, and it gets worse when you do it not into sets but in CPO. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to do something which, if you go away and do the uh, do the calculations, is equivalent to to this. Uh, but seems a lot nicer. Um, seems a lot more like doing conventional um, domain theory. <coughs> and so it doesn't bring in these, uh, these complicated functor categories. <coughs> so what we're going to work with is what's called FM sets and CPOs. So this is something that, um, well, it goes back to some work on the, uh, for the foundations of set theory, which is quite old. But it's recently become a bit more popular uh, in the, uh, the work of Andy Pitts, who's been looking at the semantics of programs which manipulate terms with variable binding. So we're interested in dynamic allocation and references. And Andy has, inter has been interested in how you write, uh, how you design a programming language which lets you manipulate terms, bits of syntax, so the sort of thing you would do in a compiler, um, but in a way that is guaranteed to respect the variable binding structure in those terms that you're manipulating. So the, uh, the idea is that one of the things that you frequently get wrong when you're writing programs that manipulate terms with binding, like compilers themselves, uh, is that you mess up the variable binding. You, you often have to kind of make sure that things are fresh for other things, and you have to make sure that you don't write functions which are sensitive to exactly what the variables were. Um, so the idea is that you would be able to design a, a language sort of like ML, say, but which had special treatment, not just for data types, but for data types that themselves had binding in. And um, he was trying to give semantic models of a, of a language which allowed you to deal with syntax with binding in a way that was guaranteed to preserve uh, alpha equivalence on the, on the terms. And we're going to use the same technology to reason about dynamically allocated references in the, um, in the semantics of, uh, of ML-like languages. So, uh, so what are they? So the idea is, what we're going to do is we're going to fix some special set called atoms. And in our case, we're going to take this special set just to be this set of locations that I was talking about. Okay. So, so, so we have some special set, countable set of, uh, of atoms. And uh, the idea is everything that we ever do, all the objects we ever consider, are going to care about some finite collection of these atoms. Okay. So formally... An FM set first. It's a set um, X equipped with an action, which um, so pi so pi is in 
uh, terms of L. So pi is some permutation on L, so something that takes, takes locations and swizzles them all around. Um, then an FM set X comes with this action, which I'll write as a splot. So pi splot X um, is going to be uh, in X. And what I mean by it's an action is, well, pi splot X, if pi is the identity permutation, had better, so uh, uh, id splot X equals uh, X. Um, and if I compose two permutations, um, then that had better be, um, better be respected. So uh, pi composed with pi primed full splot uh, X is uh, pi um, splot pi primed splot uh, X. Okay, so, so it's a set equipped with this action which tells you what happens to each element if you, if you permute um, um, the, um, the L's. And the, uh, the condition we need is, not, is that as I say, every, every one of these elements of our, of our special sets is supposed to only know or care about some finite collection of, um, of these atoms. So the condition is that for all uh, uh, x in x, there exists some finite collection of atoms such that for all pi, if pi of L equals L for all L in big L, so, so for every element of the set, there's some finite collection of atoms such that whenever you have a permutation which fixes, leaves unchanged every L in that finite set, then pi splot x is equal to x. Okay? So every element, um, the, the action has the property that if you have a permutation which um, it can do whatever it likes to the rest of the world, but if it, if it leaves this finite set alone, um, then it leaves x alone when you when you form the action. Okay, so it turns out that from this definition that every element has a smallest um, collection of, of, of such locations, which we'll write sup of x. Uh, the proof of that is actually harder than it should be, but um, okay, so, uh, so every element is finitely supported. So it's a set, there's an action of permutations on the set, and for every element in the set, um, there's a finite collection of things such that every permutation that leaves those guys alone leaves the element alone. And you can see that kind of is going to correspond to what happens in our, in our semantics of the programming language. So as things run, if I've got a function, it may have generated a bunch of references. Those references are stored in the closure for that function. That function knows about some small collection of references, but uh, it will treat any other reference, any unknown reference, it will treat all those equivalently. It can't tell the difference between, th between any fresh reference. It only knows about a finite number, so it can only care what happens um, uh, to those. So that's a, oh, I should say something about maps here, right? So maps in the category of, uh, of FM sets are functions from the underlying set. So it's a function from X to Y, which has the property that it's what's called equivariant. So the maps in the category are things which themselves um, don't know about any names. So if you have some, um, uh, so I'll say that uh, F of uh, pi splot X equals pi splot f of x, okay? <coughs> so a map in the category is something where if you, p if you swizzle around the argument, you could equivalently have applied the function and swizzled around um, the result. Um, and this is, a, this is a perfectly nice category, modulo one complex thing. But now, we, because our language has got recursion in, we don't want to just work with FM sets, we want to work with FM CPOs, so we kind of mirror what we do when we step from steps sets to CPOs normally. So an FM CPO is going to be an FM set which is equipped with an order relation and that's going to be equivariant. Okay? So what that means is if X is less than X primed, then pi splot X had better be less than pi splot X primed. And furthermore, we have least upper bounds of all finitely supported omega chains. So in ordinary CPOs, we say whenever you have a, um, an omega indexed ascending chain of things, then there's a least upper bound. And here, we ask for least upper bounds of all chains where there's some finite set that supports every element in the chain. 
So it was kind of interesting. Uh, so you're not allowed to have a chain where, where more and more stuff is in the support of everything uh, up the chain. So in particular, this means if you, if you forgot the, um, um, the support structure, though, an FMCPO need not actually be a CPO in the normal, uh, the normal sense. So you yes. Yes, 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 yeah, that's right, that's important. Okay, um, and uh, so maps, uh, maps here are equivariant and continuous, so they have to preserve the, um, the order relation and preserve um, least upper bounds. And uh, the interesting thing about this category, the important thing about it, is that it is uh, bicartesian closed. So it has products, it has coproducts, and it has a function space. And the function space is interesting. <coughs> so, um, try x. So, function space uh, x arrow y is going to be a collection of uh, continuous functions uh, f from uh, the underlying set uh, x to y, which are themselves finitely supported. So, there's we'll, there's an action of permutations on functions, and it's uh, it's given by a kind of common pattern, conjugation pattern. So um, uh, pi splot uh, f is defined to be uh, lambda x dot pi splot f of pi to the minus one splot x. Okay, so the action of a the action of a permutation on a function is you invert the action of the function on the argument, apply the function, and then apply the permutation on the uh, uh, on the result that you get back. And uh, this action. Uh, so, so we want the collection of functions which are continuous and which have finite support according to this definition of action. So um, there's a small technicality. This makes this, this, makes this category slightly odd uh, because you'll notice that the collection of maps, I said, maps in the category were equivariant. They don't themselves know about anything. They, they kind of, they're, they're, um, uh, they're indifferent to the action of any permutation, whereas here, uh, um, so an element of the function space can know about some some names. So, in so the technical jargon is this means the category is not uh, well pointed. So, uh, so if you have a map from one into uh, x arrow y, and you have a map from and a map in the category from x to y, there isn't a bijection between these two things like you, like you're used to. Um, but uh, but that doesn't stop the category being Cartesian closed. It just means we have to be a little bit careful when we're working with it whether we're talking about this guy or this guy. We can't just be completely ambiguous. Okay, so that's an FMCPO, um, and the idea is that it's, it's just like an ordinary CPO, but it just builds in this extra piece of information that we're going to need to give a semantics to these. Pro Hi. Are you sure that's what you mean by maps? That that bijection looks like it's part of the uh, No, because um, because no, these I mean these guys can have no. This isn't this isn't part of that. So it's, I mean, there's not a bijection between the, this home set here and this home set here. That's that's, that doesn't hold here, right? Because so so these these guys are these, these guys are only in projection by the, with the guys here that happen to have no support. Um, no, I mean this can pick out this can pick out uh, functions which are equivariant and functions which are not equivariant, and the function from x to y is always equivariant. Uh, yes, but the thing the thing that it returns can have non-empty support. But, but one, one is actually non-trivial. Indeed. Yeah. So that means that if you get an equivariant map out of a point with something actually trivial, then it has to be something with no support. No. No. That's right. Um, the, the underlying set of x arrows by one certainly have more. That's right. And if the category is not even closed, it means not even closed category that is given set through bijection because I think very tough to get one to the correct. So what should I say? <laughs> the underlying set of x or y instead of maximum one and two? Oh, okay. All right. Well, all right. Yes. Well, that's, yes, that's obviously okay. I was just attempting to say that in a, all right, so yes, my attempt to say that in, in the jargon of morphisms was, uh, 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 was mistaken. Yes, yes, you're quite right. Okay. Anyway. 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 These uh, the underlying set of this and, and uh, this this home set are definitely not in bijection. So, <coughs> so this is going to this is going to provide us in a universe in which we can interpret uh, um, our functions and our, and as 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 you'd expect a uh, a function which is uh, uh, is going to is 
the interpretation of some closure which has been generated uh, after the program's been running for a while, we'll know about some bunch of references. And this is going to be the, the thing that kind of lets us talk about the encapsulation that, uh, that we've got. So there'll be, there'll be some bunch of references that a function uh, knows about and cares about, but it won't care about, um, about others. So, <coughs> so here's the semantics of types, inductive on types in the usual way. And um, there's an interesting monad in here. So, um, so these bits are easy. So, um, <coughs> so unit's the one-point set. Uh, int is the, uh, is the collection of, uh, of integers viewed as a discreetly ordered um, FMCPO, and the action on here is the trivial one that leaves everything alone. Um, the interpretation of sigma and ref is going to be the, uh, the set of locations itself, which is trivially ordered and which has the obvious action that pi splot L is pi of L. <coughs> um, the interpretation of products is products, coproducts is, is um, coproducts, and then the interpretation of the uh, computation types is going to be this uh, exponential in the, um, uh, in the category of FMCPOs from the meaning of uh, tau 1 to T of the meaning of um, tau 2, where the semantic monad T is this slightly scary looking gadget. Now this is kind of like the same thing I was talking about yesterday. So this is actually a combination of state and uh, continuations. So, uh, so this is a continuation monad. Uh, this, uh, uh, this FMCPOO is just the uh, Sofinsky space. It's the trivial two-point set, one uh, 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 a bottom and a top, with the top uh, higher than the bottom. And the action is uh, uh, bottom to bottom and um, uh, uh, top to top trivial action, rather. So, uh, so the interpretation, so that the monad here, so this is, a, this is a, a continuation monad which you can view in different ways, right? So you can, so if, you, if you recurry this, this is a continuation monad with result type S arrow O, and this O is going to model whether or not the program terminates, um, or thinking more, um, uh, 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 more operationally about it, the idea is you're going to take in a continuation which expects a new state and a returned value in D and will tell you whether or not you terminate, and from that you get something which takes in the initial state and tells you whether, uh, whether you terminate. And just to make the model a little bit more accurate, I've used this strict function space here, this guy, because, because this has got a bottom, this thing's got a bottom, and so uh, it turns out that, um, that we always want to be strict in the continuation of the past. Where S is the FMCPO of maps from, so finitely supported maps from locations into um, the disjoint union of, um, of uh, integers and locations. So, so this, is, this is actually a slightly weird beast. So, so by being finitely supported, uh, this means that the states we consider are, um, they don't have a default, uh, they, um, they don't all agree on any default value, but they're all, they're all constant on all but a finite number of values, but they can themselves all have different uh, uh, um, uh, constant values for all the, uh, uh, all the uh, irrelevant locations. But, uh, yes? So the double arrow on the trivially supported function so yeah, yeah. And the uh, lollipop is equivalent of invisibility. Yeah. Okay. Oh no, I lie. I lie. No, 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 no. Finitely supported and strict. <coughs> right. <coughs> okay. So now here's the here's the interpretation of terms, at least the interesting bits, and uh, it's written out uh, in gory detail. Um, but some of it's easy. This bit's easy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, so. Uh, so if you have a, uh, a location constant, then the meaning of that location constant in the syntax is equal to that location context I constant in the model. Good. Um, so now here's the, uh, here's the meaning of the let construct. And this is indeed um, uh, just what you get from, um, I mean, this is just the meaning of let for, the, uh, for this monad, which is a combination of state and continuations. Um, so, uh, so the meaning of let x be m1 in m2. So we've got the environment comes in here. We've got the continuation. Um, that's going to be applied to the result in the final state, and we've got the initial state. <coughs> and the meaning here is you take the meaning of M1, you feed it rho, and then the continuation you feed that uh, expects a final state S primed and a returned value D. And what it does is it takes the meaning of M2 um, and feeds that the um, updated environment, so this is binding uh, uh, X here to, uh, to the D that's um, going to be fed in by M1, um, it feeds it the continuation that we got in the first place. It feeds it this new state, and this whole thing is fed um, the initial state. So this is just the obvious definition of let for this, uh, for this monad. 
And similarly, this is the obvious definition of val. So you have environment, continuation, and initial state. And because it's a val, you just immediately apply the continuation to the state that you had in, and the value that you feed in is the meaning of v. <coughs> for, uh, for dereferencing, what we do is we look at the we look at the value, <coughs> the meaning of v in, uh, in rho. Oh, I should say the meaning of values, which I... <coughs> um, yeah, so the meaning of values doesn't take a continuation, obviously, because it's not in the monad um, or a state. Um, so we take the meaning of the, um, of the, of the value v, and, uh, and we look to see uh, if that is um, in left or... Um, uh, um, Yes, that, so, so the, meaning of the, the meaning of the value is going to be, I, is going to be either a... Um, I'm trying to work out why that's got an in on it. Um, yeah, yeah, so I'm looking up in the state, but, but why is this... Why, oh, oh, so there's an S around it. That's all right, that's fine, that's fine. That's perfectly correct. Right, okay, good, jolly good. So we, uh, so we evaluate the meaning, of, uh, the, the meaning of V, and this will return us something of, type, uh, 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 something of type location. And then we look up in the store... S that we were fed in to see what value is stored there, and it had better be in the appropriate sum and. Um, so, we, so we see if it is in the appropriate sum and, um, if it's uh, if the type sigma here was um, uh, was integer, then this had better be in whichever side was integers, and uh, if this was some other reference type, then it had better be in the other side. And um, we then apply the continuation to the unchanged state and the value that we got from looking up in the heap. And if it was in the wrong place, well, here I can't be bothered to do add errors, so I'll just diverge. Um, but uh, well-typed programs will never, uh, never diverge for this reason. Okay. So assignment, again, we take the continuation in the initial state, and we're going to apply the continuation to some updated state, and the value we feed it in is just the unique value in the, um, in the unit type. <coughs> and the update to the state is pretty much what you'd expect. You, uh, you update what you get by taking the semantics of the uh, L value uh, with... Uh, the appropriately tagged semantics of the of the R value, <coughs> and now here's where all the cleverness happens, right? So this is this is this is the entire point of messing around with all this FMCPO nonsense. Um, is so that I can actually give a semantics that means something to dynamic allocation. So, <coughs> what's the semantics of uh, ref v? So v is going to be some value, and we take the semantics of that and we're going to tag it with the appropriate thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to call k, the continuation, with the initial state extended with, or uh, modified rather, because we haven't got a notion of the, uh, of the domain of the state, all the states are total here, um, s with l updated to be this thing, and l as the, um, as the return value, for some or any l which is not in the support of um, all the stuff that's around. Well, so one way I could have written this was I could have said for some any L which is not in the support of um, K or um, S um, uh, or the meaning of V or something, but I've written it in this slightly more complicated form here. So this says some any L which is not in the support of, and now you'll notice that this function here is exactly the abstraction of what we're going, so what we're going to do with that, uh, that um, freshly allocated location. So. <coughs> The reason that this is a good definition is we've set everything up so that um, because everything is finitely supported, we can find a location which is not in the support of this thing. And because it's not in the support of this thing, then we know that the behavior of this thing is invariant under with the choice of whichever one we take. Okay, so the, 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 whole, the whole thing at the end of the day gives me top or bottom, I've terminated or diverged, and we're guaranteed that we get the same answer, terminate or diverge, whichever one of these L's we pick that's outside of the support, because that's what being outside of the support means. It means, um, well, and obviously because the, the action on, the, um, on top and bottom is the trivial thing. So, um, uh, so we've set all this up so that um, we can find something which is outside the support, and whichever one we pick, we'll get the same answer of termination and divergence. And the reason I've written not just the union of the supports of K and S and the meaning of V um, is this thing, I mean, semantically it's exactly the same, but this thing makes it clear that what we're doing in the semantics here is you can pick any location which is fresh for what you're going to do with it. 
Okay? So that means it doesn't mean any location that you've never seen before. It means any location whose choice won't make any difference to the subsequent evaluation. So the quantification here ranges over things that, if you like, dynamic, dynamically have sort of been allocated in the past but have been forgotten about. Nobody, nobody's behavior in the future is going to depend upon them. So this kind of builds in a very strong extensional semantic notion of, of kind of garbage collection, if you like, or uh, indifference. So, so, so as I say, with this, this L could be something you've seen before. Um, it, it, so long as its choice would give you the same answer at the end of the day as picking something that you hadn't seen before. Okay? So all this FMCPO stuff is just set up so that I can actually give a sane uh, semantics without any mention of non-determinism or anything to, uh, to the dynamic allocation. And then, and then the, uh, the semantics of the recursive function definition is given by a least upper bound which is computed in just the same way uh, as it would be in the, in the uh, semantics for, that we had yesterday. Okay, so this all looks, um, looks very clever and satisfactory. And, um, oh, well, first we have to prove a theorem that says that the operational semantics and this denotational semantics match up. And um, uh, this is proved in an entirely standard way. We, we prove uh, soundness that says if the, um, if the program uh, uh, terminates, then the, um, <coughs> uh, then the uh, denotational semantics is top. And that's proved just by induction over the uh, derivation in that, um, uh, in that inference system. And uh, the converse of that that says that the denotational semantics is top just when the thing terminates is proved by a logical relation between the syntax and the semantics, which is sort of the, the, the classic way of doing, uh, doing these proofs. And a corollary of that is that if you have two terms whose denotational semantics are equal, then they are contextually equivalent according to the definition of contextual equivalence that comes from the, uh, from the operational semantics. Okay, so but the interesting question is, when are things equal? <coughs> well... We get some things that we wouldn't have from a naive denotational semantics. So in particular, we can prove that this is a contextual equivalence by going into the denotational semantics. So this says x gets ref v1 in let y get ref v2 in n. And this is contextually equivalent to let y be ref v2 and let x be ref v1 in n. So we allocated two fresh locations and we swapped around the order of the allocations. And indeed, the denotational semantics validates um, that, uh, that these two things are, are equivalent, as you, as you might expect, because you can perform the, uh, uh, perform the permutation action that just kind of uh, chooses the other one, and you know that everything's invariant under that. So that's good. So this is, of course, one of the structural congruences for, for the pi calculus, um, that nu x, nu y, uh, uh, p is the same as nu y, nu x, p. The other uh, obvious structural congruence to do with uh, new name generation in the pi calculus is the one that says you can garbage collect unused names. So that corresponds to this equivalence that I think I probably wrote up at the beginning of the talk, that um, if you say let x be ref v in n and um, <coughs> uh, uh, x doesn't occur in n, then uh, that's contextually equivalent to, to just n. Much to my surprise, having actually done all this, it turns out that this really simple equation doesn't hold in this model. So we've gone through all this work just to give a nice denotational semantics to, uh, to new, new reference allocation, but it's still a long way from letting us prove the kind of equations that, uh, that we want to. <coughs> so, so what goes wrong? Ah, right, oh, should, I should say, yes. So what goes wrong? So the problem is that um, there are still... Um, <coughs> There are still things which can detect, for example, um, uh, there are equivariant functions that say, is there some location in the heap that stores three? Okay, so this thing treats all locations equivalently, right? It says, is there some location? It doesn't matter what, wh which it is, so it's a perfectly nice thing in the model, uh, but unfortunately it can obviously be disturbed by writing four to what may have been the only location that contained a three. Okay. Um, <coughs> I, I mean, actually, well, I mean, when we did this, I kind of expected this to hold, but it, uh, uh, there we go. Um, so, yes. So you're saying the semantics not fully abstract. It's yes. It's well. I mean, I, I, I for a language like this, I, um, I, I would be foolish to even hope for full abstraction. Um, but uh, but what's rather more important is sufficient abstraction, right? I want I want a semantics that validates all the principles that I can get my head round. Um, <laughs> Operational, they are, they are contextual equivalents, but Indeed, we can't yes, prove yeah. it with our denotation. That's right, that's right. <coughs> so, 
But, but we have, I mean, we have achieved something, right, in that we've, we've, all, we've got a semantics which actually makes sense, right, which was, was, was hard to do. And as I say, the presentation in terms of, uh, of uh, FMCPOs is a lot more tractable and easy to work with than, uh, uh, than using function categories, which is uh, the way that people have looked at these things. I mean, it's actually equivalent, but, uh, but it's a lot easier to, uh, uh, to work with. Um, so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to do something to make it better so that we can prove these, uh, these equations. So we had to have a starting point, and we've got a starting point now. Um, but now we're going to refine the model by um, uh, uh, doing something that equates more, more stuff. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to define a logical relation over this model. So for every type, there's going to be there's going to be a relation which says when things are equivalent at that type. We're going to make this definition, and then we're going to be able to show that um, that things are, are in that relation, and that this relation implies contextual equivalence, and um, and then we'll be good. But it's going to be a little bit more complicated than that. It's not just going to be a relation at each type. We're actually going to index this relation by a collection of parameters. So so for every every one of these parameter thingies, there's going to be some relation on uh, on the heaps. And there's going to be some relation on the meaning of the types um, for, for every type. And then we're going to show the normal fundamental theorem of logical relations, which is this, this theorem that says that the denotation of every term is related to itself. Um, and then that's going to allow us to show that terms with related denotations are contextually equivalent. And then we'll be able to prove our interesting equivalences by showing that the two sides are in the, um, are in the, uh, in the relation. So... I should say something about the motivation here, I guess, because otherwise the definition looks a bit scary. Um, so the idea is <coughs> when, um, when we've got two programs in our hands, um, there's going to be, they're gonna, we're going to put them in some context, and the context is going to know about some collection of locations. So those locations, the context can read and write arbitrarily, okay? because it knows about them. It will only ever know about a finite number of them, but it has unrestricted access to those. Um, there will be other locations which have been dynamically allocated in the past and are only accessible via functions that the context has access to. Okay? So function, there will be functions in the context which, for example, uh, like... Uh, Oh, I've long since wiped it off, but um, which have a reference embedded in them. And so every time you call a function, it increments the location or, um, uh, or, or looks at it. But it never reveals the location to the outside world. So that you can only get at those, um, uh, those reference cells indirectly through calling functions that someone's given you access to. And the basic idea is if you have some, um, some relation between stores such that every function I give you preserves that relation... Okay, so, so uh, if, um, if, I, if I'm going to give you a, a bunch of functions and every single one of those functions has the property that if you start it in stores where, where the, the, uh, that are related by, by this relation, you end up in stores that are related by this relation, then the only, thing you, the only things you can do is you can call all the functions I give you access to in some order with some arguments. And if every single one of those preserves some invariant, then at the end of the day, that invariant will be preserved. Okay. And that's going to be the idea that we use to prove these equivalences. Um, so, for example, that, that counter up and counter down, there'll be a relationship between the two stores which says the value stored in this hidden location on this side and the value stored in the hidden location on this side are uh, the negations of one another. And every single call to those functions preserves that relation. And then you can show that whenever that relation holds, the two functions always return equal results. And so uh, we'll be able to prove, uh, prove equivalence. Okay? So the whole thing is going to be parameterized by the relations that hold on the not directly accessible parts of the store, okay, and that's what that's that's what the parameter is going to uh, is oh, going to hold okay. in it. So, um, so the thing is, we're going to have chunks of store which different functions know about, and it's going to be important to know that these chunks of store are disjoint from one another. So, um, so if I've got one relational invariant and I've got another relational invariant, uh, the action of one function may uh, may mutate the storage that is important for one of these invariants, and I'm going to have to know that that doesn't affect another. Uh, relation invariant. So we're going to do something that's like a relational version of separation logic, effectively. So we're going to care about relations that only themselves care about part of the heap. So, um, so we have all this FM structure, and you might expect that finitely supported relations would do the trick. But again, this turns out not to work for the same reason as that um, contextual equivalence didn't hold. Um, there are uh, relations that themselves have, um, have empty support, but, um, but don't, uh, don't give you the properties that, uh, that you want. So here's a Here's a relation between stores. It says two stores are in the relation. If there's some location 
that on both sides store zero, for example. And again, this thing has, has no support, but if you write to the store outside the support of this, you can change whether or not things are in the relation. So the notion of support doesn't give us what we want for knowing that certain writes to the store don't perturb uh, other invariants. So instead, we're going, to, uh, we're going to work with a more explicit characterization of the bit of the store that, um, that one of these relations depends upon. So you might think, well, OK, we'll take a finite set of locations um, and, um, and we'll say that a relation cares about a finite set of locations if whenever you've got two things that are in the relation and then you have two stores that agree uh, with, the, with the ones you started with just on that set of locations, then they're also in the relation. Okay, so this says that the being in the relation is unaffected by modifications to the store outside this finite set. Right. So that, and then disjointness is going to be that the, the sets that support um, the relations are disjoint. But when you, um, when you look at the relations that we want to work with over the heap, sometimes it turns out that the part of the store that they depend upon is itself a function of the store. So this shows up all the time. If you imagine the, uh, the relation, it won't work in this language because we haven't got the rich types, but the relation that says um, there are equi equal linked lists in the heap um, on, in the two stores, right? Then the definition of being equal linked lists is going to say, well, either they're both nil or they're both cons, and then you've got equal values in the car, and then you can follow the coder and, you, and you're recursively in the relation. But obviously the amount of store that you look at to see whether you're in this relation is a function of what's actually stored in the heap. Okay, so instead of having a finite set of locations, we're going to have a function which goes from um, stores to finite sets of locations. Okay, and we call this an accessibility map. And so it's going to be a function from stores to finite sets of locations. And it has to have this special property. It has to support itself. So it's no good saying um, this, re this relation only cares about this small bunch of things. If you have to look at a whole bigger bunch of things to decide what bunch of, what, what bunch of things the relation cares about. So this has to be a function from um, stores to sets of locations, which itself always returns the same answer if the two stores are equal um, in all the, all the locations that it's going to return. So uh, in maths, it's a bit more straightforward. So for all S and S primed, um, for all L in A of S, so A, a of S is a set of, uh, is a set of locations, um, S of L is equal to S primed of L, that implies that A of S is equal to uh, A of S primed. This looks frightfully asymmetric, but if you, uh, uh, if you unpick the definition, it's not, uh, not quite so bad. <coughs> so um, I'm going to skip that quickly, I think. So then our basic definition is we're going to work with relations which are supported by these accessibility maps, and financial state relations, they seem to be called here. So it's going to be a pair of a relation R, which is just a subset of heaps, and an accessibility map, A of R, um, subject to the obvious thing. So if you have S1 and S2 in the relation, and S1 is equal to uh, S1 primed at, um, at A of R, in other words, if you apply A of R to S1, you get back a set of locations, and, uh, and these two states agree on all those locations, and likewise on the other side, then, um, uh, then the things that you get, uh, the, the S1 and S2, are in the relation implies uh, S1 primed and S2 primed are in the relation. So um, the relation only cares about those, um, those locations. And given that, we can define this kind of separating conjunction of relations. Um, so if we've got two of them, R1 and uh, R2, then R1 tensor R2 is going to be the relation on heaps uh, that holds when, firstly, so S1 and S2 are going to be in the relation R1 tensor R2 when... <coughs> They're in the conjunction of the two relations, so they're in R1 and they're in R2, but it's also the case that the supports on the left and the supports on the right-hand side are disjoint. Okay? So the key point about this is you're going to know, if you, if you know that uh, R1 tensors uh, R2 holds of some state and you, uh, uh, you mutate the state somewhere in the support of R1, then you know that R2 will still hold. Okay? So this is going to be important so that we can reason uh, in general terms, about, uh, about these invariants um, that, don't, uh, that don't affect one another. Okay, <clears throat> so the parameters to our relation are going to have two little bits. They're going to have a state type, a delta, and one of these supported relations are finite true relations. Okay. So the idea is this delta talks about the visible part of the state. These are the references that other people know about. And 
What we know about them is we know some types about them, and other people have access to those. And so we're going to have to, uh, if, if computations are going to um, uh, be equivalent, uh, we can only expect them to be equivalent when there are equal values stored in all the locations that everyone has access to, because obviously uh, if they were, if they were um, uh, had different values, then, uh, then, then you'd be allowed to, uh, to behave differently just by dereferencing them and having a look. Um, <coughs> but the, the R will be the relation on states which is um, encapsulating all the private invariants, the, the, re the, uh, the references which are not directly accessible uh, to the context, but instead are, um, are just going to be mutated by, uh, by functions. So, <coughs> so the relation on states that corresponds to one of these parameters, delta and R, is going to be the disjoint union of the relation R, the, the separation and the junction of this relation R, and being identical um, at, um, uh, at the uh, delta, at all the visible locations. And then these parameters come with an order. So, so this relation is going to express a state of the world. It's going to say a, a notion of equivalence on the world. It says we have to be equal on all these visible locations, and these are the visible locations, and then we expect the following relation to hold on the hidden part of the heap, R. And then as the, pro as, the, as the program progresses, more locations get allocated, more things happen. And so we can, we can both generate new visible locations, but we can also allocate new locations which have new fresh private invariants on them. Okay? So there's an order, this, uh, there's an order on, these, um, on these parameters where um, we say um, uh, delta R is um, uh, bigger than delta prime to R prime just when you've extended um, the collection of visible locations and you have added some, di some disjoint relation to the private part, okay? So the, so, um, the, uh, the R here uh, can be split as a disjoint union of the R primed here and some new stuff that has been, that has been added. <coughs> so this is, again, it's a possible world. So this is going to be a, kind of a cryptic logical relation is the, uh, is the jargon. <coughs> so here's the definition of the logical relation. I'm rapidly running out of time. How long have I got till? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. <coughs> we shall see. Okay. So here's the logical relation. So, um, so this is what it is to be a related thing of some type given the assumption that we've got some, um, uh, uh, one of these parameters, some relation holding. Okay. So, um, so for, for value types, it's fairly straightforward. So um, any two, uh, you know, well, it's the only relation you could possibly have on units. Star is related to star. And to be equal at integers is something which is uh, irrespective of the parameter. You just have to be the same integer value. So the relation at reference types is the set of, so this is visible locations. The meaning of, 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 of the, the type sigma ref is the, the collection of visible things of type sigma. So this is a collection of LL such that L of type sigma is in the, the state type, which represents the, uh, the visible part. And then the meaning of the logical relation at uh, at a function type here. So this is the normal logical relation thing. Under here you can see that we say it's a collection of F1 and F2 such that whenever you have related arguments, you get related results. But it's a cryptic logical relation. It's parameterized by um, the, um, uh, 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 the collection of invariants. And to be related at a function type, it's not enough that uh, you preserve this relation, because when you generate a function in one of these languages, you can call it later. So a function that you make now might get called in the future, and by in the future, more stuff has, has already been allocated, and new private invariants of other functions have been set up, and you have to respect all of those. So the definition of the logical relation of function types has to quantify over all extensions, and this is perfectly normal uh, uh, behavior for, for logical relation, cryptic logical relations. You always have to quantify over all future worlds in the um, in the definition for function types. So this says, we relate, so functions are related at delta r if for any delta primed r primed which extend delta r, when you give me uh, tau related arguments there, then you get um, uh, 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 tau primed related computations. And the relation on computations, remember that we've got this monad around which is this state and, um, and continuations monad. <coughs> so the relation um, uh, on computations so we define the relation at co at computation types in terms of a relation on uh, uh, the continuations. So, um, so two continuations are related just when, whenever you give them related arguments, you get equitermination. 
Okay? So the idea is that two, t two continuations behave the same, um, just when, whenever you give them equivalent values, they both either give you termination or, uh, or they both give you divergence. Okay? And then we flip that relation on continuations around to give us the relation on computations, which take continuations as arguments and then return termination or divergence. So two computations are related just when, whenever you give them related um, continuations and related stores, you get um, equivalent behavior. So there's a sort of double negation going on here. Okay? So a computation is equal if whenever you give related uh, continuations, you get equitermination, and continuations are related if whenever you give them related values, you get equitermination. Okay, so why do we bother with this complicated definition? Well, there's a fundamental lemma that says that for every well-typed term, its denotation is related to itself. And a, coll a corollary of that is that relational reasoning is sound for contextual equivalence. So if you have two different terms and they're in the relation, um, here we just put in the uh, um, initial parameter with nothing in the private store. So if, these, if, the two if the denotations of two terms are in this logical relation, then those two terms are contextually equivalent. <coughs> and we can use this logical relation to prove a whole bunch of these subtle contextual equivalences. So we started with this denotational semantics over FMCPOs, which lets us give a model of uh, dynamic allocation at all, but it was pretty rubbish for proving equations, and now we've refined that model, we've kind of quotiented it by putting this parametric logical relation over the top, and then using that we can prove the kind of examples that I had up at the beginning, and, uh, and some slightly, uh, slightly hairier ones, like this one for example. Um, so this one, um, we're going to show that, um, that this function, uh, I guess, always diverges, and, uh, and this is, a, this is a, a complicated one because uh, uh, we generate this, um, we generate this, uh, this function here, uh, almost add two, and we pass it to something from the outside world. So, so it's not that um, uh, the outside world doesn't get to manipulate our private state, but that it only gets to manipulate our private state in ways that we have allowed it to do so. Um, so in this case, this thing, uh, what does it do? It takes in a, um, it takes in a reference, um, and uh, it sees if that reference is equal to the one it knows, um, and uh, if it is, then it assigns 1 to x. Otherwise, it dereferences x and um, uh, bumps it up by 2. Okay? So this is, this is a function which every time you call it, it takes in a reference and it will bump up uh, x by, uh, by 2 uh, unless you feed it that reference as an argument. And you pass this ability out to the outside world. The idea is that the outside world never gets access to x itself. So the outside world can never supply the reference which would make this branch be taken. So every time the outside world calls this with anything that it can generate, um, we will take the second branch and we will bump the thing up by two. And so at the end of the day, we know that um, the value that we get back, whatever p does, you know, it can be any, any well-typed uh, function, whatever it does, the value that's stored in x will be still even because the outside world will never have been able to mutate this thing. Even though we passed it something which, if you like, could have, could have mutated it if the outside world could come up with something which would make this test evaluated to true. Okay. Um, so there are a bunch of other um, examples that we can prove. Um, but there are some non-examples, so this is still, uh, still far from fully abstract. Um, but we can prove uh, all, the, uh, all the examples that were kind of classical test cases for reasoning about dynamic allocation that were presented by... Uh, by Mayer and Sieber in a, a classic paper from the, uh, I guess, 80s. I'm not going to talk about that, and uh, that's an example of proof. So I shall stop there. Further <coughs> 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 questions? A bit rushed at the end there, but...